Welcome, Wordcom. Welcome, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, I'd like to share with you uh, verses from Psalm 91, which uh, have been sustaining me throughout these six months of the pandemic. It reads, uh, The one who lives under the protection of the Most High dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say concerning the Lord, who is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. He himself will rescue you from the bird trap. He will cover you with his feathers. You will take refuge under his wings. His faithfulness, our Lord, will be a protective shield. You will not fear the terror of the night, the arrow that flies by day, the plague that stalks in darkness, or the pestilence that ravages at noon. Though a thousand fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, the pestilence will not reach you. So these are the things that uh, have been sustaining me throughout this pandemic. From the verses, you would see that uh, there have been listed benefits uh, that come to those who trust in the Lord. I, I have been holding to that promise day by day and be assured of God's protection. We are all in His loving embrace. So let us continue to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Good morning, church family, and welcome to our Sunday worship. I speak to you the light and the life and the love of Jesus Christ today. Well, if you're anything like me, then sometimes my faith tank or my hope tank runs low. And maybe today is like that for you. Well, the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So I encourage you to join me in giving our praise and worship unto our God. Let us focus our attention on Him and surely we'll find courage to run the race. Water you turn into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other Our God is healer
Welcome back. Uh, I'd like to uh, make some announcements that uh, we have new bank accounts in BDO and BPI where uh, we could deposit our tithes and offerings. So speaking of this, remember the Lord loves us. He has blessed us in so many ways. Despite all of these hardships, these restrictions, God has sustained us throughout these times of difficulties. So in gratitude and out of our cheerfulness for these blessings, we give back our tithes and offerings to God. And let us all pray. Lord Father God, thank you Lord for sustaining us. Thank you Lord for protecting us. Although the future seems still unknown to us, yet Lord, we continue to hold in your promise, the promise of your protection and your provisions as well. So as we receive such blessings from you, we would like to cheerfully give back all of these things, a portion actually, because they're all yours, Lord. They are things that we would like to honor you, to glorify you, our tithes and our offerings. So we pray that you accept them, Lord. And we pray that you use them mightily for your kingdom. Allow us, Lord, to just uh, thank you, Lord, as we again receive all of these things. We give it back to you. Thank you, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. sing of the Lord's unfailing love forever. Young and old will hear of your faithfulness. Your unfailing love will last forever. Your faithfulness is as enduring as the heavens. The Lord said, I have made a covenant with David, my chosen servant. I have sworn this oath to him. I will establish your descendants as kings forever. They will sit on your throne from now until eternity. All heaven will praise your great wonders, Lord. Myriads of angels will praise you for your faithfulness. For who in all of heaven can compare with the Lord? What mightiest angel is anything like the Lord? The highest angelic powers stand in awe of God. He is far more awesome than all who surround his throne. O Lord God of heaven's armies, where is there anyone as mighty as you, O Lord? You are entirely faithful. You rule the oceans. You subdue their storm-tossed waves. You crushed the great sea monster. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours and the earth is yours. Everything in the world is yours. You created it all. You created North and South. Mount Tabor and Mount Hermon praise your name. Powerful is your arm, strong is your hand. Your right hand is lifted high in glorious strength. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Unfailing love and truth walk before you as attendants. Happy are those who hear the joyful call to worship, for they will walk in the light of your presence, Lord.
They rejoice all day long in your wonderful reputation. They exalt in your righteousness. You are their glorious strength. It pleases you to make us strong. Yes, our protection comes from the Lord. And he, the Holy One of Israel, has given us our King. Long ago, you spoke in a vision to your faithful people. You said, I have raised up a warrior. I have selected him from the common people to be king. I have found my servant David. I have anointed him with my holy oil. I will steady him with my hand. With my powerful arm, I will make him strong. His enemies will not defeat him, nor will the wicked overpower him. I will beat down his adversaries before him and destroy those who hate him. My faithfulness and unfailing love will be with him and by my authority, he will grow in power. I will extend his rule over the sea, his dominion over the rivers, and he will call out to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I will make him my firstborn son, the mightiest king on earth. I will love him and be kind to him forever. My covenant with him will never end. I will preserve an heir for him. His throne will be as endless as the days of heaven. But if his descendants forsake my instructions and fail to obey my regulations, if they do not obey my decrees and fail to keep my commands, then I will punish their sin with a rod and their disobedience with beating. But I will never stop loving him nor fail to keep my promise to him. No, I will not break my covenant. I will not take back a single word I said. I have sworn an oath to David and in my holiness, I cannot lie. His dynasty will go on forever. His kingdom will endure as the sun. It will be as eternal as the moon my faithful witness in the sky. But now you have rejected him and cast him off. You are angry with your anointed king. You have renounced your covenant with him. You have thrown his crown in the dust. You have broken down the walls protecting him and ruined every fort defending him. Everyone who comes along has robbed him, and he has become a joke to his neighbors. You have strengthened his enemies, and you made them all rejoice. You have made his sword useless and refused to help him in battle. You have ended his splendor and overturned his throne. You have made him old before his time and publicly disgraced him. O oh Lord, how long will this go on? Will you hide yourself forever? How long will your anger burn like fire? Remember how short my life is, how empty and futile this human existence. No one can live forever. All will die. No one can escape the power of the grave. Lord, where is your unfailing love? You promised it to David with a faithful pledge. Consider, Lord, how your servants are disgraced. I carry in my heart the insults of so many people. Your enemies have mocked me, O Lord. They mock your anointed king wherever he goes. Praise the Lord forever. Amen. And amen. Good morning. 
My name is Martin and I'm very happy that you could join us. We're very happy that you could join Word Community Church online, wherever you may be watching this, on YouTube, on Facebook, on your desktop, on your mobile phone, on your bedroom, in your kitchen, in your living room. Thank you for joining us. Um, again, my name is Martin and I, I am a volunteer for Word Community Church. I... Um, more often than not, I am working behind the scenes with the preaching team. I also, uh, from time to time, I, I volunteer for Kids Church. And um, if you just happen to, to drop by today, if you just happen to see one of our videos of our sermons today, if uh, a friend just sent you a link and didn't provide enough context to what was happening, uh, let me help you out. Um, we are actually in the middle of a series called Pursue. And don't worry if you're joining just now, it's fine. Um, you are catching us at any point of the series, you're catching us at a good time. You don't have to start it from the beginning. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a Netflix series, don't worry. Um, but we're tackling um, this series that we've entitled Pursuit. And what is it about? It really is about... Um, how God has been pursuing His people, how God has been pursuing us up to this day. And this is most evidenced by His Son, Jesus. How is God pursuing us throughout the ages, up to today, and especially um, seen through Jesus? So, wherever we are today, um, I'd like to ask you a question. <laughs> how are you? And yes, that question has been a theme for me these past months. How are you? It's a very difficult question to answer if you really think about it. If you really want to answer honestly and truly, it's a difficult question to answer. Also, um, well, also because of everything going on around us. But answering that question, how are you? I find it reveals a lot about the person answering the question. Also, if the person answering is a Christ follower, and if, if the person has a relationship with Jesus, how that person answers, how are you, also reveals a lot about that person's relationship with Jesus, that person's relationship with God, and that person's relationship with his or her emotions. Answering the question, how are you, reveals a lot about the ecosystem of emotions, about God and that person and others. Let me uh, talk about that a bit more. I find that for some, uh, for some followers of Jesus, emotions are really something, um, something problematic. Or we, we have a complex, complicated relationship with our emotions. And I find that from time to time myself, even if, uh, if, even if I say this, um, as I say this, I realize that many times uh, that ecosystem is not healthy even for myself. Um, what do I mean? Um, some of us, no? some of us, for example, first, we deny the emotions, especially the negative ones. Diba? Um, some emotions are taboo to talk about, whether uh, in church or in small group. We don't even want to talk about it with them. We don't even want to talk about it with ourselves. What do we do? We deny the emotions, especially the negative ones. They're taboo. And so we, we, don't, we don't talk about our anger with God. We don't talk about our sadness with God. We don't talk about our disappointments with God and at God. We don't talk about those things with God. We, we, we leave them uh, at the doorstep and we say, no, that, 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 that it's not... That, that, that should admix and we have this notion that we should always be happy and always singing rejoiceful songs but we should be always rejoicing but we we don't know how to how to rejoice even if we're going through a tough time and so we don't bring those emotions we don't bring those negative emotions in prayer we don't we don't get to pray through them what do we do we sometimes double suffer we're angry that we're angry we're sad that we're sad because we feel like we shouldn't be or we also overdrive an emotion and let the emotion carry away our faith. You know? And never mind you know, the, the logic of scripture, but we let one moment and one emotion take our faith away and just we just ride that train. And that's also problematic. Or third, we wash away going through emotions. We wash that away with prayer, I put quotes, prayer and Christianese. You no. Know? 
sometimes when we go through emotions or when our friend or family member goes through difficult, difficult emotions, what do we do? I'm very guilty of this too. We have Christianese uh, cliches. Now we, we, we say, um, God has a plan. We say, um, don't worry, maybe maybe God has something better for you. Or we, we quote uh, songs, when God closes a door, he opens a window. Or we send links of, of cliche, cliche songs and verses and memes. But we don't allow that person to actually sit with us and go through that emotion with us. And we don't sit through that emotion. We don't live through it. And we don't even know what's going on yet. And we're immediately washing it away, you know. But I find that even if some people, if, even if some followers of Jesus have, have a hard time with emotions, I find that there are those whom I look up to because they have had terrible times. They've had gut-wrenching, uh, back-breaking times. And I would have given up if I were them, but they still, they still are very honest with themselves, with what's going on. They know that they could have lost their faith. They know that they would have been destroyed. But they still have that very, very very, good, very beautiful, very rich and honest relationship with God. And I'm just wondering, how could you do that? How could you do that? And I find that the answer lies, one of the, ans one of the biggest answers lie in the fact that they have prayed. They can pray through everything that life throws at them. No matter what joy, what peace, what, uh, what rejoicing, or no matter what disappointment, what, what sadness, or what anxiety they have, they can bring it to God and pray through it. And therefore, they're very honest. And when I ask them, how are you? They're very honest. They say, I'm going through some disappointments right now with so and so. And so, oh, okay, okay. And so we sit through those emotions. And then, but, but he also, or she also has this very, very good dealing with God and with others, even if they're going through those negative emotions. We're going to look at today at the Psalms. Why the Psalms and what's the connection with emotions? The Psalms offers us a very, very special resource as a prayer book. The Psalms offer us that very special resource as a prayer book because it allows us to get real. The Psalms allows allow us rather to get real. And the Psalms allows us to get, they allow us to get real with a situation. What's the real deal? What's the real situation? What's the real deal going on with everything in the world around you? What's the real deal going on with your family? What's the real deal going on with your friends? What's the real deal going on within yourself? And God knows what, what the real deal is going on, what, what the real deal is even within yourself. The question is, do you? And have you brought it out? And have you verbalized it? And the Psalms offer us that wide range of human emotions that you can pray through. But the second reality that the Psalms also give to us and remind us every time we read them is the reality of God, His bigness, His magnitude, His sovereignty, His mercy, His compassion, His love, which remains throughout the generations. And those two realities, the reality of the situation, the reality of God, points us to Jesus, the real one who allows us to live through both realities at the same time, with hope and with longing and, you know, with a sense of, okay, these two are happening at the same time. But you know what? That is what's happening and I am at peace with that and I will pray through that. It's not going to get resolved magically just after reading the psalm. You will find that some of the psalms are asking how long until this passes through. But you will have a sense of, more of a sense of hope and a sense of honesty within yourself. So how do we see the pursuit of God through Jesus in the psalms? How is that happening in the psalms? We're talking about the pursuit of God through Jesus in the Psalms. How does that happen? Let me begin by talking about the, the Psalms in general. No? In general, they will have these qualities and we will see Jesus in the Psalms through these qualities. And then let's go through a specific Psalm. First, the general ones. 
This, there, there are psalms for a particular time and purpose. You will notice the headings in your Bible. Usually, you, I'm not sure if all translations have them. Most translations will have them. This was made for a specific uh, occasion in mind or a specific instance in the life of David or in the life of the Psalter. And then what happens is um, uh, you might argue that uh, were they singing it during or after? It could have been both. And uh, the point is, they were not they were not um, done uh, in limbo, all right? It, it, it's attached to, a, to something that was really happening at that time. And God was there, right? The fact that the Psalms were written and the Psalms were sung and the Psalms, no? the Psalms are also uh, remind, reminding us of the reality of God. Knowing that and knowing that moment, God was there giving hope and comfort and continuing to pursue his people with grace. Now, even if they were the ones disobedient, even if they were suffering the consequences of their own sin, God was there still comforting them and still guiding them and still giving them a hope that they would return to God. And that is also an evidence of his grace. Second, now, second way that we see the pursuit of God through Jesus in, in the Psalms. The Psalms contain guides for worship practices of Israel's faith life. And they foreshadow the coming of Messiah. And also, because of that, it ultimately, uh, it ultimately gives a sense of hope of the fullness of God's love that we will get to experience. And if you're reading that today, you also gain, gain a sense of hope that not not everything is, uh, you, you gain a sense of hope and you're reminded that everything today is, uh, we're passing through. You know, we will get to experience the full, full, fullness of all of God's presence and love when we get to be with him uh, totally one day. Third, Jesus is in the Psalms and the Psalms were very intimate in, even in Jesus' earthly life. But Jesus is in the Psalms and the Psalms were very intimately in Jesus' life. Now, this third quality, may I uh, now branch out? May I, if, if, if it were a tab, though, if it were a browser, I'd double click this and we'll look into three more qualities. So, how were the Psalms, how, were, how was Jesus in the Psalms, and how were they very intimately part of Jesus' life? So, why, why, is there, why do I say that there's that very strong relationship? First, there are Psalms that, what, that are what we call directly messianic, meaning, um, there are certain uh, figures of speech that really talk about the coming of the Messiah. You know? And uh, these give hope to, his, to, to God's people uh, of, of the king who would come and rescue them, of the king who would, who would, uh, who would save them. And uh, these are Psalms 2, 22, 89, 107, 110, to name, to name some. And it's talk about uh, the son of God or, or the, 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 the Davidic offspring, the one who would come from the line of David, another king who would, who would save his people. No? So, and of course, we know that to be Jesus. And uh, so first, uh, Jesus is in the Psalms and the Psalms in Jesus' life first because of, we see that through the Psalms that were directly messianic. Um, second, Jesus had a special relationship with the Psalms in the sense that Okay, it says in the in the Gospel of Luke, what did Jesus say in uh, chapter twenty four? He says this that he says that he came to fulfill written about him, where everything written about him, where in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and where in the Psalms. So Jesus had this very acute sense of knowing that he was coming to fulfill not just the law of Moses, the prophets, but also the Psalms. So he knew that. And he quotes the Psalms until the end. No, they were so such a part of his life that he would he would quote the Psalms when he taught. No, you would have thought oh, if Jesus had a Spotify account, what would have been his songs? I would think that his songs would have been the Psalms. So he would have he would have uh, pressed on Psalm seventy one for this time, Psalm twenty three for this time probably, and uh, even when he was on the cross. When things were coming to a close for his earthly life, what was the thing that he said? What was one of the last things that he said? It was a psalm. It was psalm. Uh, it, it was the psalm that had the verse, "Into your hands 
I commit my spirit with his last breath. No, with, with, with one of his last breaths, a psalm was on his lips. And so he had that very, very intimate relationship with his prayer book. All right, third, the psalms are heart cries. Now, what does that have to do with Jesus' relationship with the psalms? So what if the psalms are heart cries? What does that mean? They're heart cries of God's people to God, and they're also heart cries of God to his people. They're heart cries. So that makes you think about how we read the Psalms, okay? Uh, so thank you so much for, for the readers who brought Psalm 89 to life a few minutes ago in this video. Um, we've really got to learn how to read the Psalms out loud. That's something I learned the past months. We've really got to learn how to read the Psalms out loud. You might say, wait, Martin, I'm not dramatic. I'm not, I don't have that flair. I don't even have a good voice. I don't even sing in the shower. Hold on. Try to just read it out loud, one. Two, try to get a translation just to give it, you know, a sense of, try to read it from a different translation to see a different sense of uh, where is it coming from? It's, it sounds different now. Try to look at the message you know, and compare it with your translation. Try to look at the Tagalog Bible. You know, if, 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 if the Tagalog doesn't cause you to, to see the impact in the psalm, oh my gosh, you're missing out on, on a lot because sometimes uh, reading the psalm out loud Knowing the emotion in the psalm is sometimes uh, really more helpful than just reading it um, in a deadpan way or reading it uh, silently. All right? Now, again, they are heart cries. Why is that important? Why do we need to know that they are heart cries of God's people to God and God's Christ, God, the cries of God's heart to his people? Because the cries of God's people to God and God's cries to humanity come together in the in, in they come together in Jesus let's talk about that a bit more Jesus experienced everything that it means to be a human he was denied he was he was betrayed you know he experienced our joys he was everything like us except sin he cries out for us to the father but he also brings the Father's heart to us. The Father who wants really for us to return to him. And Jesus makes, it, makes the way for us to return to the Father. Jesus accomplishes this in a very real way on the cross. The cross is a beautiful heart cry. A painful, dark, but also beautiful, beautiful heart cry. Showing us crying out to God and God reaching back out to us. You could even say that Jesus himself is a psalm because he was the one who cries out to God for us and because God, in a very real way through Jesus, responds to the cries of our hearts. So we can pray through the psalms. You see, the prayer book, the psalms, no? of course, God's people have been accessing it for years. God's people have been accessing it for ages and they've been using it for different points of their history. But even now, today, in 2020, wherever you are, you open the Psalms and there's suddenly uh, a new lens if you're a follower of Jesus because now you can see that you can pray through the Psalms because there was one who really um, who was really crying out on your behalf and God crying back out to you as evidence through his son. And you can actually see that today when you read the Psalms. It even says in the book of Hebrews, you know, if you fast forward the story, the, the real high priest, the high priest who, the high priest who performs, uh, who performs uh, the, the traditions you know, for, for, for God's people, the real high priest, who is that person? The real high priest is the one who can sympathize with God's people. The real high priest is the one who can sympathize with God's people. Uh, and Jesus was that. Jesus became flesh, agonized, feared, cried, every, every way like us except sin. So we can trust him, that he knows what it means to be, to be human. But in the same way, no, he is also the one who brings God's heart to us and makes the way for us to be even heard by God. You know? And for God to even hear us and for God to be reunited with us, for the Father to be reunited with us. 
So when we pray through the Psalms, we can have that lens in mind now. You see, and even when, when you think about it, even the Psalters at that time, because they didn't know the ending of the story yet. They didn't know the ending of the story yet. And you can have that picture now. It's, it's like when you're watching a movie, right? When you're watching a movie, um, for the first time, you didn't know that this was a clue, that this was a clue, and then, but at the end, when you see, oh, okay, and then you watch it again. And then now you see, oh, wow, what, a, what an amazing story this is. Because there, it was so masterfully written. Okay, I appreciate it a lot more. You will see the, the love of God lovingly, you know, lovingly written, lovingly put to words and paper in the book of Psalms. And when you see Jesus' life as well, and when you cry out to God through the Psalms, you get to have a bit more of an appreciation of what it means to pray through everything in life. That's why we can pray. Okay, so that's why we can pray through disappointment, through betrayal, through through mistrust, through through happiness. Bahat puro negative emotions sila sa because you can pray through 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 glee and through through bliss. You can pray through all of that because of Jesus. So what do we do? All right. So what do we do? Knowing, knowing that, uh, knowing that uh, Jesus is the one, really the one who knows us and cries out to God for us. And um, he was the one who brings God's heart to us, accomplished in a very real way on the cross. And that's why the Psalms come out, come out so much more alive. Why is that so, so important now? Now, what do we do? Now, what do we do? But first, again, read it out loud. Read the Psalm out loud. Go through the Psalms, read them out loud, and get a, get a different translation if you want. No. But here, um, more, than, more than the diversion or reading it out loud. First, get real with the world and yourself. As you read through the emotions being brought about by the psalm, get real with the world and yourself. Am I also longing for God? Am I also as content as the psalmist? Am I also as, uh, as joyful as this person? Am I also wanting to ascend you know, with, the, with, with God's people? Uh, yes, no, maybe, why? Why is that? No, what is this heaviness in my heart? Or am I am I lamenting like the psalm? Am I asking for justice like the psalmist? Uh, get real with the world and yourself. Again, I said this a while ago. I'll say this again. God knows what's really in your heart. The question is, do you? <laughs> do you? And have you brought that out? Have you verbalized that? And have you brought that to God? And second, get real you know, with a bigger truth of God's sovereignty his mercy, his grace, and his love. Have those twin realities and know that that's possible to have those two realities more importantly because Jesus, you know, experienced everything in a very real way and he allows us to connect once again with the Father. Now, let's have a let's have an example. Now, let, let's go through let's go through one particular psalm and this was the psalm that was read to us minutes ago. Psalm 89. Let's go through it now. Verses 1 to 37, there's a promise of God's steadfast love. Steadfast, unchanging. And I think we have a song. We have, we have a song. Uh, we, we sing that sometimes. I don't know if we sang it because we're recording it at different times. So we, we, did we sing it? I'm not sure. But there's the song that goes, I will sing of your love forever. I will sing of your love forever. And... Um, you're reminded of that kind of song as you read 1 to 37, verses 1 to 37. There's also that promise to David, that covenant to David, that the offspring will come, that the offspring will come who will rule in an eternal kingdom. Beautiful, verses 1 to 37. It feels like a different psalm from verses 38 onwards. Why, why do I say that? Because the beauty, the, 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 the intense uh, image of God, somebody who has steadfast love, who has a promise that will endure, suddenly it changes, it shifts in verse 38. Nagkaroon ng turn yung story. What happens? 38 onwards, the psalmist is asking, God, did you forget your promise? You're taken aback. The audacity to ask God, right? God, did you forget how long? Now, how long? How long? Must we suffer? How long must we, must we endure this? We're being mocked. 
your people are being made to endure such suffering, but you're, I'm remembering your promise. I'm remembering your promise of all of your steadfast love and your covenant to David. But the reality is, I'm really longing for you, God, because I'm having trouble seeing where you are right now in this day and age. And then it ends with this statement, blessed be God. The psalmist has that kind of faith. No? He puts both those realities together and then he says, blessed be God, who knows far more things than I do, whose heart is far bigger than mine, and who has plans that unravel in a better way than mine will ever do. And so the psalmist says, I trust and I, I praise you still. Blessed be God. But the ending is, of course, more beautiful than what the psalmist hoped for. All right? Because that psalmist probably didn't even get to see the Messiah come. But the Davidic offspring, the one he talks about, comes. And Jesus rules in a way no, that in, in a far better way than the psalmist could have ever imagined that the Davidic offspring would rule. They might have been thinking of a physical kingdom, but it was actually foreshadowing not just an earthly kingdom, now, not just an earthly kingdom, not just that, but a heavenly kingdom. And the Messiah saves us not just from our earthly needs, the Messiah saves us from even our deepest needs, especially our need to be saved from our own sin. Especially of our need to be saved from our own sin. So could the psalmist have imagined you and I, the psalmist wouldn't have imagined you too, but could he have imagined us talking about the salvation brought about by this Davidic offspring today, thousands of years later? No? So the psalm comes true in a very real and a more beautiful way because of Jesus. The promise of the steadfast love, how come God's love is, how come we can still call it steadfast? Because even throughout the ages, the love of Jesus remains. Check. But even through our own sins, even through our own failings, even through our own flip-flopping on God, Jesus' love remains. It is steadfast. And that is a steadfastness which is more than can be said about time. It's not just about the time. It's not just about the length of time and the steadfastness of God's love, but it's the steadfastness even in dealing with us. That is how steadfast God's love is. And so in Psalm 89, we saw that. No? Uh, get real with the world, what was really happening Get real with, with yourself. Now, the psalmist was that, was doing that. But he also had the greater reality that there was a promise of God, of steadfastness of his love. And when we read that today, we can have those both realities. If you're having trouble seeing the hand of God today, pray through Psalm 89. Now, be very real with that situation. But, in the same, but at the same time, be very, very cognizant too of verses 1 to 37 of the promise of his steadfast love. And remember, that Jesus himself is the one who makes, who makes the crying out to God and God crying out to us real. Because Jesus is the one who, who cries out to God for us and brings uh, the heart of God to us, most evidenced, most brought about by his sacrifice, his death, his resurrection for you and me. So let's look at it in a broader sense. No? Let's look at it in a broader sense. Well, reading the Psalms, no, well, you can see probably that well, reading the Psalms um, changed my outlook on life and on God. It probably could. It probably could. It helped change mine. And I think, no, uh, I strongly suggest that it could change yours as well. But can we apply that in, to a bigger society? My outlook, does it apply to a bigger society? Maybe in a small way it could. How? Well, today, you know, uncertainty looms large. Pains of people are very real. Getting real with our own emotions and with our own pains and with our own joys or truths in ourselves 
allows us to be more sympathetic with the realities outside of us. It allows us to get real with the reality of the world around us. Now, when we, when we get real with the psalm, it allows us to see that broader reality as well. That, okay, what's the real situation happening? But the psalms, on the other hand, allows us to also get real, not just with the needs of the people of this time, but also with the hope that we have in Jesus. Reminds us of the reality of God. So when people look to us, when people look to Christ's followers and then ask, why do you still have this hope? Why do you still have this hope? Even with so much of the reality going on, you know, with, with reality getting more and more real every day, and with you still clinging on to your God, how are you able to do this? You say, we are able to bring these two realities in our hearts. We're able to carry both realities in our hearts. You know why? Because we don't exchange one reality for the other. Both realities are true. And we're able to hold them because we've been trained by reading the Psalms, but also because in a very real way, we know, we know by reading the Psalms that the final word is not the reality at hand, although we're very honest with it, but the love of God, which is a bigger reality than we would have ever imagined. Let's get real. Let's pray together. Father, uh, technology, despite technology, despite distance, no, we pray together. And I pray for everyone, anyone listening to this, most especially who needs to who needs to know that he or she can be real with you whatever he or she is feeling and that the bigger reality really is your love for him or for her and if you're that person who really needs to know God's love or really needs to bring something of yourself in Jesus Take that time, take that time today, no, take that time today and I pray that you know Jesus, you know that he, his love is steadfast and that he is the one who cries out to us and that he's the one, he's the one who cries out for us rather and he's the one who cries out to God on our behalf. But he's also the one who brings God's heart to you and me. In a very real way that happened through the cross. He took our place in the cross. And if you accept him into your life today as the one who did that, you will be able to see, really, that the two realities are something that you can pray through. For those of us who need extra strength today, extra rest, or just a break today, Lord, grant true rest in you, true rest in your arms. May sleep come to those who need it. And may your life, your love, your truth and your joy and your hope be so alive in our hearts. And may that be even more real than the realities that we have today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.